welcome to another episode on Employed AF Dad. My name is Adam. And I'm Leslie. Today's show is very exciting. We have our first guest on the show today. It was so exciting. <laughs> I love it. So we had a conversation with Matt Gardner. He is from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. He is a multitude of things. He's a recovery coach. He does um, breath work. He's a breath work guide. He is a sound therapist. Um, he does story work. He is a podcaster. He's a musician. Man of many talents is Matt. And we connected on Instagram, and he was gracious enough to be our first guest on the podcast. And we talked about a number of things. We go into his story um, and talk about uh, how you know music has played a part in his, his life and um, his coaching, what a recovery coach is, how he became one. Just really fascinating conversation with Matt. Yeah, so many different topics. And he is, he's fabulous. Yeah. He's absolutely fabulous. Yeah, his vibe is amazing. Um, uh, if you want to follow him on Instagram, all this is going to be linked, of course, but at recoveryroadmap.me, uh, Matt Gardner. And just, again, really, really appreciative of him being the first person to kind of yes. say, yes, I'll, I'll be the guest on your podcast, even <laughs> though like nobody probably knows what your podcast <laughs> is. So really, really thankful for um, him doing that and really enjoyed the conversation. And we hope you will, too. So enjoy the guest, Matt Gardner, the first guest on Unemployed AF Dad. <laughs> All right, we are here with Matt Gardner. Thank you so much for joining us. First guest on our podcast today, Matt. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much to both of you. I'm completely honored. I said that before, but I definitely want to get it on the uh, the recording on as well. The record. Honored to be yeah on the record. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Really yeah. pleasure to meet you both. Yeah, great to meet you finally as well. And uh, congrats. I know you have an upcoming anniversary or alcohol free day coming up soon. I do. And you know, I, there's a, it's just so happens I was working on the sign before I got here. It wasn't like I brought a prop, but I guess it is right next to me here. So I'm going to show it. Yes. Oh, four yeah. years sober nice. as of uh, Saturday. So thanks. Yeah. I'll that be doing the, awesome. getting the word out. There's a few of those, as you guys, I'm sure uh, have seen firsthand, the Instagram sobriety community is amazing. So yes. there's a lot of those uh, uh, shout out sites that you can put your, uh, put your story up there. So I'll definitely be partaking in those. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. Hey, look, again, thank you so much for joining. Um, I know you have your own podcast, Beyond Recovery. You've been Thanks. a guest on a multitude of podcasts, so you're probably quite good at, at sharing your story. But I did want to ask you, you know, to share your hero's journey, as you call it, um, yeah. in as much detail or as little detail as you like, um, just so anybody listening can kind of get to know you and, and what you've been through and how you ended up where you are today. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. And, you know, as I'm coming up on the sober birthday, as with birthdays in general, I get very reflective, for, you know, point of reflection for sure. So it's cool that you caught me at this time to be able to look back on it, right? right. It's, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I'll go right back to the beginning. Uh, my first experience with drinking was, uh, you know, it's, it's on both sides of my family, as, as tends to be the case, it seems, uh, with a lot of people. Uh, so my dad was, was a heavy drinker. And uh, my uncle Paul on my mom's side, heavy, heavy drinker. So when they would get together, I would notice, you know, the five-year-old version of me would hear in the other room, could be middle of the day, could be evening, just the volume gets turned up on <laughs> the way that they're talking to each other, the music gets cranked, and I'm going, what is going on with these? Like, why they're just acting so, you know, goofy almost, right? And I go in there and, hey, Matt, come over here. You got to try this. And they hand me the beer and, you know, yeah, so five-year-old, five I have... Yeah, right. Oh, just a, wow. just a little sip, right? It's not like right. I had a, was crushing beers with them by any means, but <laughs> just it was like the quote unquote harmless. You know, I'm a child of the '80s, right? So they're just like, oh, have a little sip, try it out, right? So that was my first sip of beer. Was I, I remember it, right? I remember it as a formative memory and did the whole, eh, it's so gross. How do you drink? Right. And they laugh, right? And you know, and I'm maybe a bit older, six. Either way, I was, I was a young, young, uh, young kid at the time. And there was something intriguing about that, though. There, I, I, I do have this sort of rebellious side to me. I was a good kid for the most part, but there's definitely a little bit of, of, um, you know, as teenagers tend to, there was definitely some re rebellious side that I had, and that definitely it was intriguing to me. I'm like, there's something about that. They seem like they're having some fun there, and, and something about that drink that they're having that they shared with me. So that stuck in my mind. You know, honestly, like getting into my my teenage years, I was hesitant to try drugs and alcohol 
uh, partially because I was just, just a, a shy kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then partially, I think there was a part of me that really knew that I would, um, I would sort of take it and run with it, you know? So I just, I just seen so much of it growing up. So part of me was like, Ooh, I want to st- steer away from this as, as long as I can. And, you know, I, I was into sports up until about grade 10. And then I, uh, I turned into, I, that's when I started experimenting with marijuana and, and some drinking. I liked marijuana right off the bat. Um, and drinking took me a little bit to get into. And that's when I started playing guitar and getting into music. And by the time I was into music, you know, then I'm, it's so glorified, right? It's like the whole identity of like the rock and roll lifestyle. Absolutely, yeah. uh, you know what I mean? So very, I got, I got out of sports and then I'm like, oh, music's my new thing. And I'm reading like Led Zeppelin biography about them destroying hotel rooms and just drinking i'm like oh this is this sounds so fun and you know so it wasn't long before i was you know getting pretty inebriated and uh you know had a weekend band that we would just play in my basement just get hammered my mom was out or whatever my parents split pretty early when i was 13 years old as well which definitely contributed to my whole you know perspective of uh of life and everything right and um and just dealing with with um feelings that were coming up and 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 so forth um so yeah by the time i was playing bands um definitely living that rock and roll lifestyle i enjoyed that uh you know every weekend drinking every weekend quickly turned to um i would say like daily drinking by the time i was in like my early 20s i moved out to alberta which is up in canada mm-hmm. uh with legal drinking age is 18 and that was one of the reasons i picked alberta i was like oh i, could, <laughs> I can play my band out there i can drink at the bars you know so as soon as I turned 18, I moved out to Alberta and, and uh, you know, it's like when you're a musician, that's what I wanted to do with, with my, as a career, I'm a professional musician. So, okay. and uh, musicians, like one of the only professions where they like encourage you to drink on the job. <laughs> I show up and they're like, here, drink up. I'm like, right. okay. I'm like, I'm the entertainment for the night. And I'll be like half in the bag. They're like, Oh, I'll have some beers. And like, sounds get good. Your buzz going. Yeah. Yeah. Ready, right. The, right. Yeah. The creative juices. Right. So yeah, that was, that was, that was my, up until about 27, I'd say that was definitely my lifestyle, right? It was just a lot of partying, staying up late. I got into, you know, my, uh, psychedelic mushrooms. So I was doing like microdosing before microdosing was a thing. I was doing that three, four times a week, you know, and, you know, always maintaining my job. I was still getting promoted at work. My band was doing well. I'd play in like three bands that were gigging around town and such. So I never viewed it as a problem. I was like, very much, I guess what you'd call a high performing drinker, whatever that is. Uh, so I was, that was, that was how I gauged my behavior and how I internalized that inner voice that was questioning my drinking. Cause around that time there was like, Hey, by that time I was drinking daily, um, you know, I could have a night or two off and that would be enough. I'd be like, Oh yeah, see, I got the, I got this under control. And then I would drink double to almost make up for it you know the next night right. sort of thing you right? reward yourself for going a couple days yeah <laughs> right yeah 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 you, yeah you, you relate to that part of the story uh <laughs> so by 27 i actually hospitalized myself for acute pancreatitis from just a heavy heavy binge drinking weekend so i was in the hospital for three days and was doing the wow. whole like please like just you know, if i get out of here like i'm a right. changed man you know doing the praying to the to the lord above and, you know, I took like three bags of, uh, of whatever the, uh, the fluid is. I already forget the name of it um, to rehydrate me anyways. And mm-hmm. the first like eight hours, they didn't know what it was. And I, I, I imagine I wasn't as forthcoming as I could have been. Right. I, was like, I don't know what's sure. wrong. I just yeah. feel really <laughs> just gross today. Feel right? <laughs> yeah. Right. So that didn't help. Um, you know, so it was like eight hours of like the worst pain I've ever been in. And, uh, you know, they're doing all these tests on me and they finally figured out what it was and gave me some pain. Uh, management uh, medicine and that's when i was just oh, i've got to change man i get out of here blah, blah. no i had a brush never with death again right yeah, yeah I never drink again right and then so on my, my the hospital was about 15 minute walk from where i was living at the time and uh, here in alberta it's like say without hyperbole i'd say like every especially in the area i was in it was a, like uh there's a lot of pubs and it's like the university area so it's mm-hmm. a lot of pubs and It's like every street corner, there's a liquor store. So I'm walking by all my liquor stores on the way home. And it's like, you know, so the first one I'll walk by, I'm like, done. I'm done with this. Second liquor store, I'm like, you know what? Like all of a sudden there's part of my brain that's going, you know what? Like that was whiskey that did that to you. Have you ever considered being a beer guy? I'm like, (laughs) so then by the third liquor store, I'm like, you know what? 
nobody's ever had problems with beer before. That was like, <laughs> I can't, I, I won't drink whiskey, you know? So I'll, I'll hold that part of my, my, uh, the deal that I made with the, with the Lord, you know, the Lord above. Uh, but I just, I, I, I'm a beer guy now. So I grabbed a six pack of beer. So within 20, not even like within like hours of getting out of the hospital, I, I had a beer in my hand, you know? And wow. so, yeah, so I continued to do that for another few years and, and like, I could sort of gauge like when, you know, that I was walking up to the line in my pancreas or something inside of me would start kind of like pulsating and throbbing and I'd be like, Hey, I'm done for the night. And then go lay in my bed and just like literally pray that it wasn't going to cross over that threshold and rehospitalize myself. And, you know, so I, I went about, you know, going about that for another three years. And finally, when I was 30 years old, it was like, it was so strange, man. And but to both of you, it was like, you know, I, I kept leveling up. Like the universe kept giving me these wonderful things. Like I, I was 30. I, my, my band got a, a grant for $10,000 to record a professional album. I got promoted uh to like this brand new store uh i was working at a grocery store so i was a bakery manager and i was give, essentially given a, a brand new store to open up which is sort of the uh tip of the cap to the you're mm-hmm. the the top guy or, or gal at the time to to be able to do this it's a really big um you know uh acknowledgement right mm-hmm. uh and then meanwhile my drinking was ab- as absolute worst and my personal life was at its absolute worst so it was such a strange like these highs yeah. that gap that i was telling you about as part of my story of leveling up otherwise and my drinking just you know sort of being underneath that the gap between that was as massive at that point in time uh so you know i had a relationship um go sideways on big time go sideways on me and that was finally when i was like i can't keep going on with this Mm -hmm. so that was my first um stint of sobriety i I, you know i i took five weeks off to uh from work to, to sober up and that was dude that was i mean that was very challenging to you know put that, the first time I asked for help, you know, or admitted yeah. that I had a problem. So I was 30 at the time and very, very challenging thing to do. And I, we can circle back to that if we, if we want to, I know it's a, it's a good topic for a lot of people that, that would be listening. Um, you know, and then, so the first, out of the five weeks, the first two weeks, I went on this massive bender to get it out of my system. Right. <laughs> like, and then I have, so I have three weeks. And at that point I was like, okay, I got to go one way or the other here. I'm either going to just continue this binge and be like uncle Paul, my uncle Paul. I was telling you guys about, mm-hmm. or I'm going to just actually give this sobriety thing, this recovery thing a try. So mm-hmm. I, uh, I went to my first AA meeting. A friend of mine took me there. He had already gone through NA and NA. And uh, that was kind of our all our olive branch. We'd had a falling out, um, you know, over substances. And his name's Brent. He took me there. And um, yeah, that's literally what changed my life. We went into the, uh, the AA together that night. And honestly, I wouldn't have gone in if it wasn't for him. I was very nervous about going in. Sure. And um yeah, as soon as we sat down, I literally felt like this physical weight come off my shoulders, whatever may have been there. I started tearing up, just being in the energy of, uh, you know, like-minded people like that. And yeah, I was like sober for three years, three months after that. That was 2012 to 2015. Um, you know, then I, uh, the ego, my ego crept back in again, just con- continued to, you know, climb the corporate ladder. I got up to assistant store manager. Um, you know, things were just my, my relationship, uh, the, the gal that I had uh, had a falling out with, we had got, come back together. She had also sobered up independent. Like we didn't know that each other had sobered up. So the million dollar question was, are we compatible? Um, Cause we we're always the party couple, right? Were we compatible sober? And it was like so much more beautiful and more, so much more depth and nuance to the relationship, as you can imagine, uh, without <laughs> substances, right? right? So, and it was like, this is a beautiful thing, right? And then, so I'm like, well, you know, everything, like, you know what? Everything's make, aligning. And, right? Yeah. Everything's like so perfect. I'm like, you know what would make this even better? We started drinking again, right? <laughs> I was like, I'm like, we've learned all the, like, we, we've, it's, that was in the past. We'll ne- we won't never go back to the way we sure. were, right? And so that, that was the ego side of it. And then, you know, uh, for the next, I'd say three and a half years, oof every moderation technique known to 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 mankind we tried and it was just you know like we'd only drink on the weekends and then every weekend turned to a four-day weekend we'll only drink when we go out all of a sudden we're going out every night we're only going to drink if we keep it in the garage all of a sudden we're like hanging out in the garage all the time <laughs> right, like, like, right. no matter what we tried we just like plowed through whatever parameter we tried only to drink after so. a certain time four o'clock yep. five o'clock whatever yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah all of a sudden it's like noon we only drink after yeah. noon <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> right? it's like everything that we put in, in front of oh yeah and i'm like <laughs> this is the funniest one in my opinion 
is like I started like buying the local local beer. I'm like, well, I'm supporting local, you know, <laughs> like feeling good about myself. Just like You're literally. Doing thing, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it's just like, oh my goodness. And that really shows the uh ah oh man, the uh the craziness of like addictive mindset, right? Now mm-hmm. it's like I know I realize now it's like a pattern. It's not me. There's like a pattern inside of me. Uh you know that's you know that, that, that just has a very tough time controlling it and then has a very clever way of justifying mm-hmm. and like it's it's like a, this lawyer or something he's got like all the answers you know what i mean and yeah it was it's it's been an interesting journey um you know and then so to wrap it up how i got into this like four years of sobriety um was 2019 or so late 2018 my dad passed away uh he was 66 which to me is just so tragically young, young yeah. right for nowadays like it's not like mm-hmm. 1940s where people you know that's as far as they lived it <laughs> sure. so 66 like he had just retired and um you know again because i mentioned he was a pretty heavy drinker so my perception of what happened to him uh was just that he would like his drinking just escalated he started smoking cigarettes again randomly like that's a thing to do and um yeah i don't know he just his health went, went downhill pretty quick and i think you know he'd been a firefighter for 35 years and no, I think there's a lot to do with identity and he was a hero, right? And he has this thing to do. And, you know, I just, I, I, this is again, my perception of it. I didn't talk to him about this, but I just, I don't think that he quite knew what to do with himself, you know? And, and then as a result, you know, it's uh, the, the drinking starts kind of, you know, creeping in just that little bit more. And, you know, he passed away a couple of days before Christmas, 2018. And, uh, you know, by this point, uncle Paul had already passed away at 50 something, uh, 55, I think from, complications to do with drinking so both those guys to take it back to the beginning of my story uh you know when i was five years old and seeing these guys partying away are are no longer with me and here i'm 37 and i'm going man i'm on the same road here you You see the long-term effects of it uh, yeah yeah right and so i um fast forward a couple months to the april of 2019 i was heading out back home to go uh do the celebration of life for my dad and you know it's like one of these things where i think it's just like the recipe it's like everything's got to happen a certain way for it to take shape for me uh in this case and it was what it was is you know i came out of just like a really uh rough party weekend before i went drove out there so i'm in edmonton um and prince george where i'm from is about eight hours west of where i'm from and right in the middle literally to the minute to the kilometer is uh the canadian rockies and it's a beautiful town called jasper alberta and it's right in the Rockies. And it was a spot that my dad and I spent a lot of time because obviously it's like the halfway point between both uh, where we were living. You know, so I'm driving out there and just completely hung over. You know, I was doing like cocaine and, and everything else that weekend. And I got like a couple hours of sleep, you know, and I'm just like driving out there and driving through Jasper. And normally I have this like surge of energy and inspiration when I'm driving through there. And I had none of that. It was empty. I felt very shameful and uh, just dark and heavy mm-hmm. and uh, i took up my phone and i just i got to get this energy move and i felt this like what's going on with me you know and and i just sort of, I, I i deleted it right after but i think just getting enough to spark something inside of me yeah i think i imagine there was a degree of like asking for help you know and just verbalizing it and getting out and articulating it really helped and you know but there was like some suicidal ideation and you know uh just like you know like super uh, derogatory inner diet like self-talk right like really getting down on myself and something happened there when you know i i think it was like a i would say it's like a st- spiritual intervention of some kind where halfway through jasper when i went through like super dark and then all of a sudden it was just like okay like everything shifted in me he's like i've done this before you know i've done three years sober before i can do it again you know uh my dad and his dad his dad's dad, like that whole line of fa- the family was like heavy drinkers, Irish, right? Very stoic, have your drink after work sort of thing. And mm-hmm. so I'm like, I can end this like pattern of alcoholism with me and it can stop with me and it will stop with me. So that was, you know what I mean? It's just like that combination of like having that rough weekend, getting out of my normal environment, going to pay respects to dad, having that like intervention of s- spiritual, energetic, whatever you may call it. I would call it both in jasper in such a spiritual location for myself that has so much nostalgia and such and then going home and having such a beautiful uh connection like my brother my older brother uh and i hadn't been home together in 20 years 
So we were driving around, seeing all the old places we grew up and, you know, the whole thing uh, just really shifted me. And that's, you know, what's basically launched me into what I'm doing today. Uh, you know, and so that was, that was, yeah, that's pretty much my, my story, all the uh, highlights <laughs> and, and lowlights, if you will. No, well, thank you so much for sharing. I mean, it's, there's so many questions that we have, uh, <laughs> out, you know, from that story, but one thing yeah. I wanted to kind of point out is what's, what's relatable for me is you were mentioning like everything else in your life seemed fine. You were getting, you know, promotions at work and, and, you know, the band was doing well and, and things from all outside appearances, you were, you were doing great in life, but internally you were struggling with this. And, and that, that's kind of relatable because, you know, a lot of people think, you know, you have to hit quote rock bottom and everybody's mm. rock bottom is going to look different. Right. But you know, sometimes society thinks of the people who have lost everything. They've lost their jobs. They're homeless. They're, you know, brown bagging it on the streets. And yeah. it doesn't have to look like that for everyone to realize that there is a problem and you need, you know, you need help. Yeah. Oh, very well put. And, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned the, well, not funny, but like curious that you mentioned like that brown paper bag. Cause I think that's such a common caricature of mm -hmm. what people think like alcohol, you know, the alcoholic is the guy that's talking to himself, but never mind the fact that, you know, as, as far as we've come with mental health recovery and mental health in general, I'd say in the last like five to seven years specifically, it's been such a refreshing jump, hasn't it? And, uh, you know, the, when you see a lot of those people, those unfortunate, you know, the homeless people, there's like mental issues on top of that mm -hmm. too. Right. So it's not necessarily just the, the drinking part that's what I know now, but yeah, absolutely. Like for sure. Well put, you know, it's, I think there's a lot of that that happens and that's, that's the easiest way for us to continue to, that was the easiest way for me to justify to myself. I didn't have a problem. Right. Exactly. When, One other thing I wanted to mention before I forget, sorry. Um, yeah, you were talking about moderation. So you, mm -hmm. you were sober for three years, three months, and then you thought, you know what? I've learned a lot. I can, I can moderate, you know, my alcohol, I can bring it back into my life. And I just want to kind of get your thoughts on moderation because I think, you know, society were kind of bombarded by the message, like enjoy responsibly, drink mm. responsibly, you know, everything in moderation. Um, yeah. I know you, you tried moderation with no success. I've tried moderation with no success. Can people moderate their drinking? And you I know, know that's a loaded question, but yeah. kind of just, I would, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on that. So yeah, for sure. I think it's, it's, it is person to person. Um, you know, so the generalization, I think it's like when you're, when you're past a certain threshold, I would say, absolutely. I would say no. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people would, yeah. I mean, for me, I had to bang my head against that wall for three plus years to, to understand that I couldn't right, and try every little trick. Right. And, um, so, you know, my experience, absolutely not, you know, and there's a great quote that I, that I heard, I, I want to say it was Michael Jordan. Um, yeah, I'm so bad at remembering the specifics <laughs> and I'll be paraphrasing, of course, but sure. he said something along the lines of like hundred percent is easier than 98%, you know, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll like yeah. it. I'll compare it to like a diet, you know what I mean? When people are doing like a cheat day, what are you focused on the, the, the full, you know, the, the six days of the week and you have the one cheat day, what are you focused on? It's going to be the, the cheat day, right? Cheat day, I can't yeah, wait to have those course. donuts on Saturday, yeah, right? Yeah. And is that really an enjoyable, you know, lifestyle? And that's how it was for me. It was like, you know, not necessarily white knuckling, but it was definitely on, you know, top of mind, like, okay, mm -hmm. Thursday, I'm going to go to O2s and, you know, the, the local watering hole, right. And, you know, let off some steam or whatever. So that was where my focus was going and my energy was going. And, um, yeah, it was really taking me out of the present moment. Um, you know, there'd be a lot, I'd be a lot lower in some spaces. Like it was just more of a roller coaster, right? As far as my emotions and, and my energy and such. So I, I would dare to say that, yeah, 100% commitment. And that's, I mean, it's frightening, right? It's yeah. very mm -hmm. frightening to sure. a lot of people, especially in, in early sobriety, to hear I can never drink again. Like it's just like, boom, like that's right. pretty final, right? And that's why we micro dose that down to one moment one day at a time one percent at a time one step at a time right because that's what you, that's encourages you to stay present and you know focus on what the moment in front of you the one step ahead of you right as opposed to the uh the finality of of you know the next 30 40 <laughs> 50 years right this has such a different energy when you think of it like that so to get back to your question um depending on where you are in your drinking career 
I dare say that moderation is one of the most dangerous things that you can do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I would also dare say that it's, it's, um, uh, very challenging and i would highly recommend against it right no i i completely agree and i can kind of resonate when you were saying you know like earlier in the week you would be looking forward to you know thursday night going out or you you, you're not present in monday through wednesday because all you're doing is focusing on that next time you get to drink and even though you're not drinking for those days you know your your focus is elsewhere and um and then for me, when I got to that weekend, that's when I would just drink way too much because I was anticipating it all week. Right. I was like, you know, again, rewarding myself. I was so good. And, yeah. and now I'm going to reward myself on the weekend. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, good point. Also, let's get into what you're doing now. You are a recovery coach. So yeah. do you mind explaining that to those of us who maybe not know what a recovery coach is and kind of how you became a recovery coach? Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to get that out there as well. Um, yeah, so I, you know, so 2019, when I mentioned I'd, I'd sobered up, um, and I'd been I, by that point a little over 20 years in the career that I've been doing. I got hired at 16 at this, uh, like Western Canadian grocery chain. I'm not sure if you have like a Safeway or something like that where you guys live. Um, not here in the Midwest, but I think I've heard of it. Yeah, we, okay. we have, we have, uh, more local chains here and kind of like Aldi and things like that, but okay. So it'd be like, it's not like a, by no means a Walmart. It's like kind of one of those more scaled back, like, yeah, like a local grocery store. Right. So it's a, um, you know, like, so there's like 80 employees there kind of thing. Right. At any given time, um, just to give you like a size. Uh, so anyway, so I've been doing that for, since I was 16 up until, uh, you know, at that point in time, 37 and just sort of part-time closing punk kid in the, in the back, right. Mm -hmm. Until assistant store manager, all the jobs in between. And, um, you know, I was, I was getting to the point where I was getting, as soon as I removed alcohol from me, I really started getting in tune with what I would call my intuition or, uh, you know, I was, I was starting to ask myself this different things, like, because I was definitely in that pattern or trap, a uh, trap might be a little dramatic, but like of the, the whole, uh, accomplishing things, right. Okay. I'm assistant store manager. What's next. Okay. Then I want to be a store manager never really asking myself, is that really what I want to do? So I started doing that, you know, as I'm approaching 40 at that point in time, I was like kind of having that existential crisis or whether they used to call the midlife crisis. Like, am I really doing what I'm supposed to be doing here? And I I was getting that big time and I was able to start asking myself those questions and feeling into it because I'd removed the numbing agent. Otherwise I'd probably still be doing it, to be honest with you. In fact, I would have been still doing it, right? Uh, money was good, right? I was getting six weeks paid vacation, benefits great, you know. I don't know. I had a great identity there. I had a good reputation. So it, it would have been very easy to stay. Uh, but yeah, there was definitely something as soon as I removed alcohol that was like, yeah, it was like a, a feeling that I had in my stomach, actually. And I was starting to get this like feeling of dread and anxiety between shifts. I was going, hmm, this is interesting. What is this all about? So fast forward a couple of years and, you know, we, we started going through COVID. I didn't necessarily favor the direction of the, the company it had gone. It was getting to be very, I understand like the, the, um, improving year over year, but I felt that it was so aggressive to the point. It was very challenging to, um, you know, take, take care of what we needed to take care of. It felt very big business versus like how I'd been raised in the company, sort of a family business, right? It, just felt, I could feel there was a, a change of, of guard, if you will. And, um, and then the pandemic hit and the grocery store was, uh, it was definitely a challenging place to work sure. as yeah. most places were. But I mean, people were literally like getting into fights over toilet paper in the aisle. I'm just like, Ooh, <laughs> oh, I, I you know, remember that, that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't really, this isn't part of my, you know, I have never experienced this before, you know, and, and just everything to do with the, you know, the pandemic and enforcing masks and all this different stuff and getting people it was just, it was a trip to be honest. And, and that just really expediated this, uh, feeling of like, I just, I wasn't fulfilled is what it came down to. And, um, I ended up taking six months off. I'd never taken anything more than like a week off here or there. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to take a sabbatical. I'd saved up enough money. I'm like, and I'm just going to do some stuff that I've always wanted to do, you know? And, uh, and then I'll go back and I'll be refreshed and I'll do another 15 years there. No problem. And like, (laughs) I'll tell you, it was very interesting. The morning number one of my sabbatical, I, I woke up and I was just doing my thing. I had, I don't know if you guys have ever had like 
inner dialogue, but it's like beyond the usual inner dialogue. Like it was definitely, uh, I felt it was like somebody's voice, like a guide yeah. or, or uh, mm-hmm. you know, I would love to say it was like Morgan Freeman's voice. Like God, he was talking. <laughs> it wasn't quite that, but there was, it was, you know, just, just dialed back from that. And it was like, you're not going back. You're never going back to that. I was like, wow. I'm like, interesting. Who's first of all, who said that? And like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I like, I liken it. It's like my gramps on my mom's side. I, I, I've always thought I had a connection with him. He passed away quite early. I was like 18 when he passed away. So I feel very connected to him. And so I don't know if it's, I just say it's gramps. So, you know, and so I explored that. So I, uh, you know, halfway through the sabbatical, I was like, okay, what do I like about the job? Cause there's still elements I like, and I definitely like the coaching mentoring. So I'd have 20 plus years experience. The people that were coming up were getting so rushed into these positions. There was no, you know, like stay in a job for three or five years, really learn the ins and outs and then get promoted. It was like, okay, we need the next crop people, like slam them into these positions. And yeah, I really felt bad for them. And like, you know, I prided myself on helping people develop, you know, getting, getting developed and just because I had the experience. So I'm like, okay, I like the coaching mentoring part. So, and then I ended up getting some certifications on my leave of absence and really acting on that. You're not going back there. I ended up going back for a couple months uh, because I ran out of money. Um, So so just to to go back and honestly, I was a little bit curious to see like, what can I integrate this like new mat into uh, my old way of being? And it was very apparent, like from day one and going back to it, it it just wasn't compatible anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I went back for four months in total. And, um, I was on the graduation call of my level two, uh, in lifted, which is a life coach certification. And the head coach is such an amazing presenter and he was getting all emotional at the end and we were getting all emotional. And, uh, I just remember after he signed off, I just stared at my computer for like, I don't know, it was probably two minutes, but it felt like my entire life flashing before (laughs) my eyes. And I'm like, I'm quitting tomorrow. This is what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Boom. I was so inspired. Right. I could just, I felt like. I'm starting to feel it now. Like you just feel like this so enthusiastic. I didn't quit the next day. I had the letter <laughs> typed up in my back pocket. I was like, you know what? I should probably like get some like financial stuff sorted out before I do this. Uh, which I'm glad I did. You know, we we refinanced the house and got some stuff sorted out. And then so I get my two weeks after that. And you know, 23 years of my life, I literally grew up in the company, right? So it was a big, big change, but I was ready for it. And, you know, so the last year or so, I, I'm like, what, I, what can I combine? And honestly, I was confused because at first I'm like, I want to help everybody, right? I'm a life coach. I want to, I can help so many people. And, and then realizing I went through a business networking uh, course uh, program that's like, well, find your little corner of the street, right? And just mm-hmm. really niche it down because you're, I'm, I'm an unknown at this point. So find something that can like, is so specific to me and my life. And what I've been through and coach that or, or park myself there. And even then I was like, well, no, like, I don't want to just, you know, so I went through that whole thing, uh, last year. And then finally I was like, you know what, this is my story. This is what I've been through and I know it so intimately well, and I can help people with it. So, uh, that's what I did. So I, I went into, uh, the recovery coaching. So I just combined like the, my previous coaching and mentoring that I've done, plus my certifications, my life experience, married them been doing it for the last uh it's coming up on a year so i debuted my my podcast my addiction recovery podcast on april 8th which was my sober birthday last year so it's Mm -hmm. two days away from that anniversary launching that podcast episode one was just me telling my story that was the first time i'd really come out with it so it was very empowering i was very sort of hiding it before and very protective over it i guess there's a degree of shame there's also a degree of just trying to control the narrative, right? I didn't want it out there so people could gossip about me. But by that time, I'd taken myself out of that previous job, and I was just like, I don't, I don't have to. Like, there's no, I don't have to worry don't about that worry, anymore, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so that was that. So yeah, here I am coming up on you know a couple of days uh, away from my one year anniversary of like officially being like a recovery coach and my four year anniversary of being sober and and yeah, it's it's been great, honestly. Um, yeah, I, I've I've ran. We just came out of a five month group that I facilitated from sober October, and it ended up going all the way through dry February. It was a wonderful group of people. Mm-hmm. Just a nice small group, you know, and uh, we were just in each other's lives daily, and 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 um, wow, it's just a really cool thing. So I can, you know, I'll I'll pause and see if there's any talking yeah, no, points that's, there. That's just so inspiring. I mean, yeah. it's the the guts it takes to quit a job and go into the unknown, you know, especially like you said, the finances. I mean, 
I can, I kind of can relate being unemployed, you know, finances play a huge part in it. You'd like to do other things, but then you have to remember, like, I still need to be able to pay bills. I still yeah. need to be able to support my family. So um, that's just awesome that you, you were able to do that. And I've been asking all the questions. So I know Leslie has some, <laughs> some questions. So I'll yeah. let her kind of take charge. Absolutely. Um, I noticed, um, oh, of course, I creeped on you on Instagram because that's what we do <laughs> yeah. here in 2023. Um, that's right. But I noticed that you had um, a breathwork certification and um, was sound therapy. Is that Yeah, correct? that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did those play a part in your sobriety? Did you um, begin to dabble into those? as you were getting sober or was that a part of kind of like your journey into getting sober? Yeah. Awesome questions. Thank you. Uh, so the sound therapy thing, a uh, little bit different as, as I mentioned earlier, I had done the, uh, you know, I always been playing in bands. I've been playing guitar mm -hmm. since 14 singing since 16. So for me, it was just a natural evolution. It was like, I found myself instead of listening to like Rage Against the Machine, which I still love. I, I love all the bands I grew up with, right? Pearl Jam, you know, again, growing up in the 90s, I was the big grunge guy. But, you know, it's like now I find that that music, aside from the nostalgia and that like, you know, that wonderful wave of nostalgia that comes along with it. Sure. it's pretty like can be kind of negative music, right? So I uh -huh. naturally yeah. found myself listening to a more like, I guess you call it spa music or like that meditation music or the yeah, chakra yeah. healing frequency music. Uh -huh. So I'm like, Hmm, I think I can do this. And then it was nice because, uh, you know, I, I still playing in like an alt rock band. It's kind of funny. I've, I've slowly been, uh, leaning the guys into like doing the, uh, I'm not sure if they know what, what that we've, that we're, uh, we're going in more into like the meditation music, I've been <laughs> slowly been walking them into it and they haven't said anything yet. So we'll see. <laughs> uh, we're such a far cry from the band we used to be. It's hilarious. Um, so yeah, that's what it was. It was just like, I, I, I got it all, all into like the, uh, so each chakra has like a, a frequency that, that, uh, you know, helps with the unblocking or just the soothing of it or whatnot. And now on top of that pure tone that you could have, like, for example, it would just be like, you could either listen to a pure tone. So it'd just be like a, which to some people is soothing. Some people like gives them the, the heebie jeebies. Uh -huh. So what I do is like, I'll tune my instrument to uh, whatever key it's in. And there may be a degree of like, yeah, I have to like tune it just a, a slight bit differently than a concert pitch. Uh, just a little bit sharper, for example. And then I can compose a whole musical arrangement over top of that uh, healing frequency. So I'm like, I, I, music nerd in me was like that's so cool so yeah. that was where i went down with the uh the sound therapy thing and then from there uh you know like uh field recordings of nature is like really mm -hmm. soothing and actually really good for your hearing like it helps you especially when you put it in like a stereo field it really helps uh keep your your hearing very sharp right and i think there's just something about it's called like planetary medicine where like that's why we go out to nature and just listening to birds and streams and such so adding some of that in there and yeah, it's like, it was a whole different way of composing music. And it's like, for me, that's like my next, that was just my next natural step. And then that way, instead of having this peripheral on the periphery, like this alt rock band that I play in, <laughs> I have this like sound therapy thing that I'm doing that can factor into the coaching. So that's that side of it. The breath work to answer that part of the question. Yeah, that was a new modality for myself. Um, that was actually like really key in this sobriety streak that I had so um and that's why I'm gl really glad you brought this up so the first time that I sobered up in 2012 2015 there was still a part of me that was like really like uh, reckless right like there was part of me that was like that's what drove me back to drinking because I was unable to find something that satiated that like eh, I just want to like sometimes I just want to like I'm so disciplined otherwise and sometimes I just want to can let my hair down you know and, uh, I was, I kept filling my, uh, trying to fill that need with like going to martial arts or like more of those yang action mm -hmm. activities. Right. And I was thinking, and then what ended up happening is the second time this so sober streak that I'm on right now, was, uh, it was, was like the opposite. I, so I, I, this time around, I've gotten into like meditation, breath work, more of like the yin activities, right? Like yin yoga. Yeah, yeah. And then I found that those activities were actually what like, it sort of melted away that recklessness. And I imagine my, my age, like I'm turning, I turned 41, uh, last year. So, you know, 
uh, is perhaps wisdom has come in, you know, <laughs> be, better judgment, uh, you know, and, you know, as, uh, sure. uh, but honestly, I think it's uh, the breath work and getting into that stuff was, and if you'd told me that, I'd be like, well, no, that's not going to do anything. Like I need something like bungee jumping or jumping out of plane. And it was like, it was actually quite the opposite. It was, it, it seems counterintuitive, but it's worked so well for me. So yeah, the breath work and the, um, yeah, the sound therapy, uh, journaling, just a lot of the like gentler, uh, more thoughtful and deliberate and intentional and mindful activities. And then I just felt that need of like recklessness just kind of melt away. That's so cool that you can use your background as a musician to do sound therapy and then incorporate that into your, your coaching, your recovery coaching. I Definitely. mean, I'm sure that that's probably adding an aspect that not all recovery coaches have and, and can Absolutely. offer. Definitely. Yeah. I, I find myself just cause I'm still new at it. Like there is still a degree of like imposter syndrome. Right. So I, I, <laughs> I like having a few different things I can offer. Uh, cause there is still part of me that's, that's a, a little bit like vulnerable about offering my coaching, uh, proposals or packages to people. And then I'm like, mm -hmm. so those are like my, uh, you know, and I can throw in some sound therapy, tra you know what I mean? It's like this like extra stuff I can put right. in. So, right, yeah. yeah. So there's like, I mean, if I'm being perfectly honest, that's, that's, that's part of it for sure. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I think there's a point of differentiation, uh, you know, from, from other coaching is just because I have those extra extra things I can do and they do show up in, in the, the style of coaching I do, right. There there'll be, you know, if somebody's coming in and they, I can see it, you know, I can kind of gauge that they're having a, a stressful time. We'll just tune into each other. We'll do a little bit of gentle breath work together. And then, you know, the whole course of the, the coaching call goes so much different after that. So it is nice to have those tools available for sure. Absolutely. Did you have another question? Um, I don't want to interrupt you. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're just going to take over. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I wanted to know, um, I mean, I know you've mentioned a lot of like um, emotional healing and things that you've done. Um, did you dive into a lot of that after um, this last time that you got sober? And were you even able to... Um, even uh, the first time you were sober for like three years, were you able to identify your emotions at that time? Or was it just kind of like, oh, I'm doing this thing and, um, you know, we're just going to plow through it? Or mm. was there um, this like, I don't know, this time forward, your second time, it seems like there's more settled, there's more, um, you're more grounded. Yeah. And the first time was more, um, um, more like airy. Yeah, if that makes sense. It does. It's a really thoughtful question. I, I love that. Um, yeah. So the first one, I'm going to be honest, like, yeah, I was, so I was like 30. I, you know, I did, I did go into personal development, you know, as much as I could at that point. Like I got into some Wayne Dyer audiobooks, right. And just yeah. the idea mm -hmm. of like intention and, uh -huh. and I, so I was really open to that and, you know, beyond like, so I was going to AA a lot and AA, I'm not sure if familiar you guys are with it. Um, wonderful. It's it saved my life. So I'm always going to say that I always have one foot in AA. Uh, I also found it to be fairly rigid, right? It's like, it's, it's AA literature. It's our way. Don't, sure. you know, if you, if you expand out of this, there's a chance you could, you know, die. You know what I mean? So it's, it's very, <laughs> very that's rigid. And that's, that's totally cool. Cause that's what I needed at the start. And that's what, you know, and again, some people are on that journey and, and that's what they need for their entire rest of their lives. So there's no judgment it's just for me personally. I, I started needing a little bit more than that. And that's when I got into. Uh, yeah. So there was definitely some dabbling in Wayne Dyer and and journaling and um, yeah, just be more present and such. Um, but yeah, the difference for uh, for now between now and then is like it's so I'm so much more advanced with it now. Um, you know, and it's, it is such a powerful question and concept, right? Because like, uh, the two most common things that I hear from people are, uh, the initial, like grieving the whole social aspect of it, like saying, mm. basically saying goodbye to some friends that you can no longer hang out with at least for that time being, I mean, never say never. Right. But there's a, mm -hmm. you know, so there's that there's a grieving of your previous identity because it's like, you're, you're no longer that party person you know so there there's a grieving in the social aspect of it that's like very powerful uh and that was you know that was part of my journey as well uh and then secondary is like when you have to get down to a brass tax and like the why the emotional sobriety part which i think is what you're mentioning leslie and 
Yeah, absolutely. That was, um, yeah, that I'm so, that's a daily thing for me, to be honest with you. I, so I have this like pattern that I took from my previous job. So I, you know, I, again, literally grew up, my entire work ethic is based on this previous career that I had. And it was very much based on achievement, achievement doer. So I have this pattern of like, and this like collapsed distinction of self-worth with achievement that I'm really working on prying those apart, right? So what that does and how that shows up is in my work, I use a lot of pressure language on myself. I have my old bosses yeah. that used to be, okay, like you have to get, you have, same words, like you have to get this done have by the to, end of yeah. the day. Like, mm-hmm. why isn't this done? Questioning of such like that and then getting down on myself if I haven't. And then it's like a race to get to this like somewhat arbitrary, you know, goal that I can cross off my to-do <laughs> list and I get the dopamine hit. And then my brain's just immediately is like, okay, what's next? Blah, blah, blah. And like, so I'm finding that it's not serving me anymore because, you know, I, first of all, I don't need to speak to myself. Like I choose to speak to myself differently. So, but you know, to stop that train, man, it's, it's, it'll, it'll, you know, that's the 20 plus years of, of running those patterns and running that inner dialogue and hearing it from other people. And, you know, my dad is a little bit like that too. Right. So a lot like that, I'm going to be honest. So, you know, that's like my, essentially my whole life of patterns that like, now that there's no alcohol involved, yes, I'm four years in, but that's, that's what's left. So it's, it's a really important topic. And I'm really glad you brought it up, Leslie. And it's like, so that's what it is. It's like, so I'm finding now, and this is like literally in the last 12 months, eight to 12 months, is that I, when I have feelings of, it's more so of like loneliness, sadness, anger, I can sit with and get through and, and, you know, kind of burn it off fairly quickly and be aware of, you know, when I'm, when I'm angry, it's like those, uh, softer, but like deeper emotions right so like um loneliness uh self-doubt and you know sadness and things of that nature that i i tend to you know there's a pattern in me that wants to like you know like oh you know cheer up or like get on your phone or do something like we don't have to feel this way like really change that change my state very quickly you know, and I think that's more of like my mom's side, my mom's pattern is like, if somebody's sad, it's like, oh, well, like, what can I do instead of yeah, just like, cheering, yeah. right. It's cheering them up it's or changing MO as women. <laughs> well, yeah, right. right? Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, let's take care of everyone else. Right. Yeah. And so I definitely am in tune with that side of myself and, and, uh, it's tough. It's honestly, it's very challenging, um, and uncomfortable to just sit with that, you know? And, uh, it's funny. Like I, I was even thinking about this the other day. Um, you know, in November, I like at the end of fall, I get very, it's like that seasonal, uh, depression. It's like yeah. pre- premature. Like, yeah. yeah. Right. Premature. Cause like, I know it's like winter's coming and Canadian winters <laughs> can get very dark very quick. And so I always get a little bit blue in, uh, in November. And I, uh, I noticed that like when I was 16, before I got into drugs and alcohol, I used to be really uh curious about that feeling and that would be like where i'd write my songs and i'd have all this like create very creative and and i was like somewhere along the line i lost that you know and and it, what i did is i started adding uh alcohol and trying to be this like you know the, the like the Ernest hemingway sitting at the bar having having some drinks and like writing mm-hmm. some you know right, writing right like i thought there was like this tormented artist i became so all of a sudden, um, I got really out of touch with that side of me that used to be such a beautiful way of me being able to process sadness. Uh, and I didn't even notice that that even happened until like, literally, like I just noticed this, this past November. So I'll have these moments where I, you know, with hanging out with my wife and I feel it. And normally I'm like, okay, I'm just feeling this way. I'm going to bounce back real quick. And I'm like, no, there's no bouncing back. Like that's not... <laughs> not helping that's not healthy so i just like you know i need just need some time to go feel this sadness and be okay with that you know and and i'll just go downstairs and that's where my musical instruments are and just hang out and you know uh, just sit with it you know and mm-hmm. and uh so yeah that's that's where i'm at with it you know it's um you know and just the whole idea of like getting out of this concept of like an emotional hierarchy where there's like good emotions and there's bad emotions right yeah. so mm-hmm. the low part it's like so as soon as there's like bad emotions well what are you going to be doing you're I'm, I'm then throwing judgment on it there's going to be shame and like guilt and other like really really low vibrational secondary emotions that attach to this sadness and 
loneliness. And then it's just like, I'm not. Yeah. So uh, it's, I'm just getting out of this idea of like a hierarchy. Um, you know, emotions are, are all there and serve a purpose and, um, and just practicing that and honoring that and, and allowing it's, a, it's more of a step of the allowing. Whereas before mm-hmm. I was like, I was so quick to just be like, Oh, feeling lonely. Oh, no, no. We'll go back down. You go. Let's check Instagram, mm-hmm. you know? Uh-huh. So it's, it's, uh, yeah. that is, uh, I think that's relatable to everyone. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. The distractionary part is so, um, yeah, that, Easy. that, yes. It's like, and that, that, that's the achiever doer. And then like, if I can't achieve the feeling away, I'll quickly distract. I'm just, it's, I'm so quick to change my state. Uh, for the most part, again, I, I shouldn't say I, I have a pattern that is quick to change my state that I'm, uh, I'm aware of now. So it's just, you know, it's, it's just those <laughs> work little in progress. work in progress, you know, 1% at a time, you know, it's, uh, you know, even if I can be aware of it for 10 minutes at a time, um, you know, by the end of the year, that's like 61 hours that I've been working on it. Yeah. So just for keeping sure. that in mind, it's, it, like big changes happen from doing little, little changes each day. Have you ever um, read the book, Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert? I've heard of this book quite a bit. So I'm glad you reminded me of it. Yes. It's, I, I, I imagine it's in my, uh, my audible, uh, you know, wish list. Cause yes, I, yeah. yeah, yeah. Tell me a bit about that though. It's a, it's a really good one. It's one of my favorites is on my bookshelf. Um, okay. but it's all about like the artist journey. So, um, how we kind of use like the Ernest Hemingway's kind of like you mentioned of like using drugs or alcohol to visit, you know, um, but she talks a, a lot about, um, well, she uses this one analogy of her emotions. And she says that your emotions um, are going on a road trip with you. Like they're always with you. You are the car and yourself is the driver. Leslie is the driver. And um, you bring your emotions with you, right? So everybody is invited anger, sadness, happiness, joy. Everybody is invited. But Nobody is allowed to drive ever. Ooh. Nobody is allowed to drive. So you can bring them with you. They're not allowed to touch the radio. They're not allowed to do anything, but they're allowed to be there. Uh, and I found that this was so empowering, especially times when I was going through deep sadness, um, to just be able to say, hey, sadness, I see you. Um, you're, you're here with me, and I feel you, and I see you. Like validating that. Yes. Um, and then being able to say, I see you, I hear you. However, you can't drive. You are Mm. not allowed to drive. I am always the one in charge, but I feel like it tempers that, um, that overwhelming feeling to where I'm just like, I can't go on anymore. I can't do anything Mm. anymore. I can't focus anymore because it's being validated. It's being seen and heard. Mm. we have two young kids and I feel like a lot of times whenever um, they're going through big emotions too, like just seeing and hearing what they have to say kind of tempers that too of like, Hey, I'm being heard. I'm being validated. Um, And yeah, it just kind of uh, it, it lets that emotion be known. And I think a lot of times that's all that that's all that's happening inside of us is Mm. like our our emotions just want to be, seen and heard and validated and processed and then you kind of they they don't dissipate because obviously you know we're humans and we're gonna we're gonna come and go emotionally but um they always just they just want to be seen and heard and validated um, yes, Matt and I are both both going to have to put that book on her. Uh, our yeah, it's, list. it's really <laughs> it's awesome, especially like you being a musician, too, because um, I mean, she's speaking to all artists and, mm. um, you know, how most artists, um, they really judge their work. And there's a lot of shame if it's not well received and like, well, I should have done that better or being vulnerable to put that out and just kind of taking that aspect out of it of like, this is just something that moves through me. My creativity is not me. It's something that just comes and happens. And then I produce the work and it's not about a reflection of me. It's just like, oh, this is the creativity that came to me. This is Mm. what I made from it. You don't like it. Oh, okay. That's Mm. cool. I'll try something else when creativity comes to me again. So almost more like a spiritual approach of something that like descends upon you. And then, um, it get, you know, you give birth to it and then you present it and, and you let people 
I guess, kind of decide whether or not they like it. But it yeah. takes like that vulnerability of, you know, <laughs> you yourself, like, oh my God, I'm, I'm staking all of my self-worth in, yeah. you know, this painting or this book or this, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But it's really cool. Yeah, I highly recommend it. <laughs> I guess you like that. Check book, it huh? out. I do. <laughs> I really love it. I, I really love it. Love Thanks it. for sharing. Yeah. As you yeah. were saying that, I remember there's actually two of my, uh, there's one, uh, one is my client, and that's another gal that was in the group, and they were passing around that book. I'm like, I'm visualizing ah. the cover. So, yeah, that's, it's one of those things, you know, like I love when the universe, you know, when things start kind of uh-huh. re- showing up. So yeah, that's like, I think that's, that's like the third or fourth cue for me to read this book. So, <laughs> so thank you. This it's an, it. yeah, it's a beautiful summary of it. It's uh that, that may have to uh, make it to the top of my, uh, my to read list now from your description of it. Nice. Nice. Thank you for that. I, uh, you know, and that's, that is a, one of the more um, powerful, I guess, tricks for lack of a better term that's kind of dismissive of it but uh, as far as like helping somebody with with emotions is as i've learned to do is is very much what you to piggyback on what you're saying there is like the, the allowing so if somebody's um used to like not feeling a certain emotion or having like uh it's sort of like been a pushed away emotion mm-hmm. i say i get them to say out loud to themselves like you are allowed to feel like for me i'm i've i've been what i think I got it pretty much narrowed down to like a fear of rejection. So, and it's specifically the, the physicality of being rejected in front of a small group of people. Cause I've had a few of those that happened like being bullied or whatever. So I've had these like really traumatic events in my young childhood that have really affected the way that I can present myself uh, in certain situations. So to me, what I say is like, I'm allowed to feel rejected and then take a nice big breath. And honestly, like, the first few times I did it, and then I say, or you could say, like, I say it to myself, so to the pattern or to my own inner child, I say, you're allowed to feel rejected in my body and then breathe. And it's just like the energetic experience that happens in my body is crazy because I've never had that sentence. I've never heard that before. Right. It's like, mm-hmm. it's, it's the opposite. It's like, ignore the, re- the rejection mm-hmm. or like, as soon as that feeling of rejection, no, push it back down. So just to sort of piggyback on what you're saying. Yeah allowing this and it's not that doesn't mean that i'm going to be rejected right and that's the distinction to make it's like mm-hmm. uh there's a gal i was talking with last night actually and she was saying she's got uh, her self-worth tied up in her business and such and she has to feel productive all the time i say well just say to yourself you're allowed to feel unproductive and she did it and breathed on it and all that and she said wow like and that's something you've never she's never heard in, in her life right it's her you know it's yeah it's to either be productive or die you know what i mean right. it's like right. a do or die situation right society go yeah. go go right? society go 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 parents told her go 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 teachers you know so well it's then just... it becomes like that subconscious dialogue like you're not even you're not even aware that you're doing it 100 you know? you're not aware that that program is running at that point that's, like, that's exactly right yep exactly right yeah yeah that's the thing so yeah when you can exactly zero in on something get that awareness um illuminated if you will because like that subconscious is that you know it's uh you're going in there with a flashlight trying to find this yes. this pattern of this magic uh, set of words that will just like oh there we go and uh, yeah you can just you can really get some big releases from that and that's what i've been working on it's a powerful phrase so yeah it's cool that you you, you brought that up thank you it's awesome yeah. i wanted to pivot real quick if i could um yeah. going back to something you mentioned earlier matt when you're talking about when you stop drinking and kind of the social aspect and kind of mm. grieving you know you were the the life of the party and and now you're no longer going to be perceived that way um i know for me personally once i stopped drinking alcohol um i think pretty quickly we had a a wedding reception or something Mm -hmm. like that where again alcohol is everywhere and i we used uh club soda and lime as kind of our our substitute um and then i've gotten into like na beers i kind of am curious your thoughts if you've used um mocktails na beers things like that to kind of substitute or be a placebo if you will hundred percent. I, in fact, I, I don't know if I would have made it that first stint. I was so into like just crushing beers to be honest. <laughs> I was like, I was at the stage where I could, you know, I'm like five eleven, one fifty five 155 pounds and I could drink like 20 beer. Like I was very, oh, wow. you know what I mean? I don't get me wrong. I was like, you know, <laughs> doing, the, doing the old, like, yeah, I was, I was by no means articulate, but I could, I could get to that stage. I was always trying to get to the end of a, of a flat of beer 
So for me to like not have a placebo like that would have been mm -hmm. very, very challenging. So yeah, I had, um, but it's funny. It's like, this is actually a uh, cool. Cause I noticed on your, uh, on your guys, Instagram, you have the, uh, some posts about like NA beers and such, which yeah. I think is awesome. Um, so the rise of NA beers has been incredible because like back in the day there was like, I would go, it's like, <laughs> Oduls the, and, Oduls, yeah. man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oduls and Molson XL, which is this, that's what I ended up drinking. So I was used to cheap beer anyway. So I'm like, ah, oh, I'll get this stuff, you know? And it was like on the bottom shelf of the grocery store, all dusty and just kind of jammed <laughs> in there. I'm like, oh, at least we got something here. And then meanwhile, now here we are like 2023, 20, whatever, 10, 12 years later, there's like an eight foot lineal section of all these like wine, beer, spirits, mm -hmm. alternatives. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. Craft beer now. Um, in fact, I have one for, uh, for afterwards here, uh, to commemorate our podcast together. Oh, yeah. So athletic, athletic brew. Yeah. Like, you guys yeah. familiar with yeah. that one? Yeah. It's yeah. really good. I have so. some of that in our fridge. Beautiful. Well, cheers. Yeah. yeah. Cheers. So, uh, to answer your question. Yes. Yes. I use them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I love them, man. Like, I, I think yeah. it's really cool. You know, it's, I needed that. I needed, I, I, my brother and I talked about this. He still drinks a little bit, but you know, he's like, you know, for guys like us, we're going to we're always going to a reward is always going to be a drink so why fight it right like i love the cracking of the can when i go camping i have a fire in the backyard i just like it you know like and i why why you know resist it why go so you know especially when there's so many wicked alternatives now like i love the heineken mm -hmm. zero you know and it's it's funny it's like I, this is a bit of a i guess a controversial subject because i don't think it needs to be but um you know, the 0.5 aspect, right? Well, you're not right. alcohol free. I'm like, come on, man. What do you, you got to drink like two cases in like 15 minutes to get even remote. You know what I mean? <laughs> to get anything. Yeah. Right. And, and then, the, and then if you actually really know, it's like, like apple juice and like orange juice or point, point 0.5, like kombucha, all oh, this, right, like apple, yeah. right. Banana, yeah. Right. Or, no, banana, I think, right. Banana or orange or something. Right. Yeah. yeah it's, it's right. It's banana. Such low amount. Right? Yeah, exactly. So then I, you know, yeah, I, there's a few a few stories I'm not going to get into because it, it might out the person that did it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, just that whole thing of like the judgment. I get it to a degree, but like, I don't know, like we're all in this together. I don't think there needs yeah. to be like judgment about it. Right. Um, I've always kind of felt like, hey, if you're comfortable with it, great. Do it. You know, totally. Don't let people tell you you shouldn't. And if you yeah. aren't comfortable with it, just then, yeah, you drink your club soda and lime or your yeah. mocktail, whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Everybody's on their own journey. And for me, it's like, and that's, it was curious because the post I had done was just all about like choosing the words that suit you. Like, what is your recovery? What is your sobriety? what is your version of alcohol free? Right. And it, you know, words are so empowering or they can be limiting. So choose the mm -hmm. one that works for you and your recovery journey. And I got some pushback from it because like I mentioned, so for me, like I, you know, I, I mentioned just a little bit of my story. Like I used 0.5 beers to get into some people that would be, uh, you know, not a successful blah, blah, blah. And I had a couple people like DM me and I'm just like, uh, you've just missed the whole point of what I was, right. you know, that post, right. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you do go do your thing, but don't, you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why it's scary to get on social media. Right. Yeah. There's yeah. always yeah. going to be those people who are just kind of, uh, reach out and attack you almost. Yeah. When you're trying to spread a good message. You think? Yeah, exactly. It's few and far between. It's just, yeah, I think the, my, the human brain obviously picks up on the trolls a little bit more than the, mm -hmm. you know, 20 or 30 other nice comments otherwise. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it's wonderful. I, I, I love to see it. Um, there's a lot more people that are, uh, it, it's a good conversation topic. You know, you bring it, what's this one? And then, you know, it opens the door to talk about, you know, sobriety and yeah. Well, even some of my friends who still drink, you know, they've tried, you know, athletic brewing or other NA beers and they're like, wow, this is really good. It's totally. it, you, you wouldn't know you're drinking something without alcohol just exactly. by, by tasting it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have one more question for Matt? Um, kind of, I mean, I had um, <laughs> a uh, thousand more. Questions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's great. It's been uh, a great conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I really for enjoyed sure. having you on. Let's mm, do sure. one more and then um okay let's see well how can i narrow this down uh you mentioned um your intuition um like kind of revving up more once you stopped drinking um was that is that something that you know you continue to um be able to hone in more on now definitely like does that grow more and more daily it does it does and so i yeah you know what and this is um it, 
I'll give it even this morning as a, a great indicator of of sort of in real time how I've, I deal with it. So I can tell when I'm out of alignment or if I'm not listening, if I'm not truly listening to uh, it, it's the difference between what I should be doing, you know, that whole should mm-hmm. the pressure language uh, versus just listening and acting out of what I believe is like my highest, you know, my highest calling or um, yeah, I would just say it's like the difference between just like sitting with something, meditating, starting. I did start off with the meditation. I also woke up quite just low energy, burnt out, grumpy. And I was fine with that. I was allowing that. I just didn't take the extra time to account for that. And I knew that I hadn't. And then I proceeded with my day anyways. Mm -hmm. So I just did my short, my my bare minimum. I do 10 minutes of breathwork meditation to start my day. And instead of um, knowing if, if I'm talking about that intuition part, um, I would have sat in bed for at least another 20 minutes or however long it took to just kind of process that. Uh, but I definitely was my old pattern and just like, was like resistant to it and just going, no, I got so much stuff to do. Bah, bah, bah. So I listened to that, the old me, I listened to that old pattern to me and my whole morning suffered as a result. So that's the difference. If I feel that sort of like dread or that, um, out of alignment, sort of anxiety, uh, worrying too much about the future, uh, then I know I'm acting out of a an old pattern, an old software, if you will, and um, and then if I am very attuned to that intuition and the listening part, um, my day goes so much smoother. It's a lot more like what what they discover is like flow, like just synchronicities yeah. happening. I go on from one task to the next. I'm actually having fun, enjoying it, dude. That's like the like the number one priority for me right now is like, cause I obviously like starting my own business has been, uh, incredibly, um, fulfilling. Uh, it's also been a lot, a lot, a lot of energy and work and that's great. Uh, but if I get on the other side of it with the old patterns, that's when that dread and all that stuff that old, the old patterns come in, um, you know, like the, uh, yeah, the future tripping, the dread and such starts coming in and then I find that I'm l- loving what I do. Like when I'm in the moment, like when I have the conversation right now, loving it, um, but not loving how I do it, if that makes sense. So yeah. it's very, it's of utmost importance and top of mind for me now to be on that other side of the attuned, the intuition and, and listening, which is so much more gentle. And again, that yin, I got to, I, mm-hmm. I, I will choose to act out of that. Uh, and I'm practicing that. Obviously, a work in progress, as we mentioned. It's 20 plus years of doing the yang, the doer, the bah, right? So it's it's uh, where meanwhile there's like this gentle, like oh no, let's just take our time. And then the, there's like this overwhelming part of me that's like no, there's so much to do. Let's bah. right. So um yeah, so I don't feel like quite answer your question, but that's that's where I'm working at it. I can feel it. I I'm aware of it, and more times than not, I can act out of that and get into a day of flow and such today was definitely uh an old pattern matt showed up and uh i definitely suffered from it as a result yeah yeah we're all human right we're yeah still learning yeah, for sure yeah <laughs> thanks for sharing that um one final thought so anyone who's out there who is um questioning their relationship with alcohol struggling with alcohol what would your advice be for them yeah yeah that's always a great question um it was just, you know First thing is like, just make sure, I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, there is a good chance that you understand the the idea of like connection, right? And perhaps you haven't found a sober group yet, uh, but you are listening and you're hearing perhaps some of your story in mine or in one of your guys' stories. And that's like, that's the entry point to me is like, you just get Mm -hmm. to a point where you're just, you're not feeling like you're alone and you're the only person going through what you're going through. Because you're going to find there's Yes, there's nuances that are like, you know, nuance obviously to your own personal life, but then there's so much like generalized, generalized, um, you know, pain and suffering that we all go through that we're in, in recovery. And as soon as you get into a, a group that can help support you and reflect that back to you and take some of that weight off your shoulders, cause we're just, we're all going through it together in, in, in a lot of these senses, uh, that'll change your life. And that's what saved my life was getting into a a spot where I no longer felt like I was all alone. You know, I did a lot of drinking by myself in secret of, uh, in secret. So 
And I think a lot of people do that in substances in general. So that would be it. Like just uh, make sure you can uh, find some connections and there's many, many different ways to do it. Instagram is a tremendous sober community. I mean, you can have a anonymous profile on there and just make some connections until you feel safe enough and, you know, to be vulnerable. And, and as soon as you get to that stage, um, I guarantee your life will change. And, you know, from there, it's like, you know, there's no right, right. I shouldn't say that there's no wrong way to do it. Always work, you know? Um, so just keep that in mind as well. There's just continue to be curious. I love the word curious. So I like the whole buzz, you know, the buzzwords of sober curious is just like, yeah, yeah, just get, get curious about why you're doing it. And this, you don't have to say no forever, just say no for a day or just say no for 30 days and, and be curious about what shows up for you. And, just take it from there. Um, so yeah, be those two things, the connection part and the, uh, the stay curious part. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh-huh. I think that's great advice. So thank you so much for sharing that. And again, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Yes. Our first guest. Yes. I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, Matt, if people want to find you, where should they go? Yeah. Thanks so much guys. I, I love this conversation. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, big honor. Uh, so if you want to find me, uh, as I mentioned a few times, Instagram, I'm on there very often, quite often. So uh, <laughs> uh, it's, Instagram is at recoveryroadmap.me, uh, as well as I have, uh, so Matt Gardner Live is my Facebook channel, I guess for lack of a better term, and YouTube channel. So uh, Matt Gardner Live, that'll be like, uh, it's like guided meditations. It's sort of a variety, like mixed bag. There's my podcast. There's various other things on there so uh those are yeah those are the easiest places to find me awesome and we'll of course link all that in the show notes as well so people can find you but again matt thank you so much for the conversation really enjoyed it and uh we appreciate it thank you it was wonderful meeting you talking to you yeah thanks guys really appreciate it